right. All right. Um, let's go to the big view. All right, we're going to, of course, dispense with the pledge tonight. I'm going to go ahead and do roll call. Mr. Bartlett? Here. Ms. Graves? Here. Dr. Lewis? Here. Alizolo? You're muted, Maggie. Maggie. Can you hear us? I'm here. I'm muted, so you didn't hear anything weird. <laughs> okay, Mr. Stelco? Aye. And me? I'm getting there. <laughs> Ms. Rankin? Here. Sorry, I skipped you. All right. All right. It doesn't all right, help that we're all out of order on the screen. Yeah, that, that's, that's, right. that's really bugging my OCD. Our first discussion tonight, of course, is going to be regarding the opening of the Marymount Swim Club or pool. And what I'm going to do, because Joe has really basically done the lion's share of the work on this, and I think we should all thank Joe for this. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. He's really, really done some work. So Joe, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. You can go ahead and talk about how great all the pool memberships have been and the volunteer work and everything that's been going on. Yeah, so uh, just let me start off and say that, uh, you know, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm willing to admit that when we started this process, I was very skeptical about how many people would buy registrations for the pool, given the, uh, restrictions that we're going to have in place this year to comply with state guidelines and best practices uh, throughout the you know, state regarding operating a pool during a COVID-19 crisis. But I'm happy to announce that the response has been more than anything I would have anticipated and probably what most people would have anticipated. But as of today, we are at uh, right around 81,000 in dues and donations. So we have far exceeded the $65,000 goal that was set uh, by council a week ago. Uh, and I wanna say that, uh, you know, it's been a lot of work in the past week uh, from a lot of people, including people on in council, uh, the pool commission, Jordan Shedd, the pool manager. Uh, it, it really came together very well. Uh, we did a flyer drop throughout the community and had great response from that. And quite frankly, I think I'm, I'm really impressed with just you know, how this community has come out to respond to this challenge. And, and uh, I'm very optimistic that as we address some of the other challenges that Marymount's going to be facing, that uh, we can, you know, uh, have similar uh, type success. Um, I just want to make a couple, you know, quick comments here. There are, were several individuals who um, made donations, and then one large donation uh, came in from the Marymount Preservation Foundation, which I wanted to make a um, special thanks to them for stepping up. And, and quite frankly, that was done uh, by a couple members of council and Mayor Brown on 24 hours notice. They, they you know, got it done and got it in the meeting and got it approved. And thanks for all your hard work on that to do it. But, uh, you know, again, uh, we're, I, I think from a standpoint of the revenues that we generated, and what's interesting is, is that the number of family memberships as of six o'clock tonight exceeded the number of family memberships we sold in 2019. So uh, again, I think it, it was very, you know, to me it was surprising, but I think it's a great indication how much the, the communities want to step up. The other thing that we have kind of going on, I'll just share this with everyone real fast. We have several residents who have donated items that we need to get open the pool. We have one family who will be donating the, the plexiglass shields for the, for the front desk at the pool. We have another family that's going to be donating the uh, PPE masks um, uh, and the uh, face shields. They're gonna come up with those so, they, so the employees have to wear. Uh, we have another family that will be donating the uh, sanitization, you know, the hand sanitization and some of the chemicals that we're gonna use down there to you know, keep the place uh, uh, clean and also safe for everybody. So uh, it's just another indication that if we you know, work with a lot of the community members, good things can happen here. Uh, now comes the hard part. And the hard part is coming up with uh, operating protocols about how the pool is going to you know, operate. The the you know one we had one question in the past week about safety, and I can assure everyone that we are doing everything possible to operate that pool in uh, the safest means possible. Uh, there was a long list of pools that are already open, and so we're going to get the benefit of you know seeing what they do and mimic the best practices as far as operating protocols. But safety is being addressed. Um, you know, virtually on a daily basis. Uh, there will be a set of uh, operating protocols, you know, more specific than the state guidelines, which were pretty vague. Uh, and, and there are 
uh, in process right now. Uh, the last I'd heard, I think we're still on track for opening mid-June. Um, and I don't know if we want to talk about the date, but I think we're shooting for the 15th is the last I'd heard. You know, we have to get a health inspection and that'll probably be the last event. Uh, but I think, you know, we're looking at that 15th as far as an opening date at this point, uh, if everything goes right. Uh, they're putting water in the pool now. The repairs were done to the pool. So it's really looking good down there. Uh, the pool commission and other volunteers were down there for the past two weekends, really you know, cleaning up a lot of stuff. And uh, it, it's starting to look good. Um, and, uh, you know, Ed and I talked today about some additional uh, waiver language uh, uh, either for participants or for the employees down there to give us just a little bit more legal coverage as, as we move forward. But uh, safety is being addressed from, you know, multiple angles at this point. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, I want to make everyone assured we're going to do everything possible to, you know, adopt best practices that are recommended by the state and or being followed by other pools that are already opening. So, um, Yep. And probably the biggest challenge we have right now is just figuring out how many people we can let let in the pool, both in the pool and on deck at any point in time. Those numbers are changing constantly. And so it's, it's, it's I hate to use the term because it's a bad pun, but it's a very fluid situation at this point. <laughs> hey, Joe, um, could you say something more? I think um, it's important for people to understand that the Hamilton County Health Commissioner, you, you touched on it, but just a little bit more about the health commissioner has to review everything before we can also open. I mean, that's that's, I think, a critical thing in terms of putting the safety plans in place. Yes, they normally, hold up for one second. I was, I was losing my battery on my headset. Um, so the, the health department, uh, the Hamilton County uh, Health Department usually inspects the pools anyway before you open. But, uh, you know, similar to what happened with tennis, they actually looked at our operating procedures on the tennis before we were allowed to open. And they will be looking at the uh, operating procedures for the pool when they come out for their inspection, for their normal inspection. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Well, so again, we, we, you know, the, the, the first challenge has been met, the financial challenge. Now the hard part starts, you know, especially for our pool manager, Jordan Shad. Uh, is about now, you know, making sure that we get everything ordered, get everything delivered, uh, get uh, good op operating protocols in place, and uh, get get the place open. Um, Ed, let me let me ask you a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Regarding um, the new indemnification or whatever we're going to have these um, guests sign, because apparently it's not part of the current um, member application form. How's this going to work? Are they going to sign something when they arrive at the pool for the first time? Is that how that'll work? I would expect that would be the easiest way to do it, Bill, mm -hmm. unless somebody has a better idea. Since they've already bought the membership, it probably would have been ideal to have it signed when the uh, memberships were purchased. But I think the first time they show up will be good enough. Okay. Yeah, the dilemma we had and, uh, for, for Ed was there was, you know, this was an evolving process. And we're benefiting from some of the other pools that have already opened and, and you know, implemented waivers that have additional language regarding the COVID-19 exposure or potential COVID-19 exposure. So, you know, um, you know it, it's something that usually we would love to have that waiver in during the registration process, but, you know, the timing just didn't line up on this one. So let me clear. So the waiver is just like a one page document that they're going to sign and then we'd have on file? Exactly. Okay, is that something, I mean, now that we have the list of everybody that registered that we could basically email to all those people and have them sign it and drop it off or bring it by rather than having to have all the blank forms down at the pool? That's a possible solution. Yeah. What, what I would say, Kelly, if I might interject, Joe and I talked about this today and uh, I've gone through so many different pools uh, safety procedures and regulations that they have. I'm looking at the YMCA one right now. It's a four page release and indemnification agreement. And Joe and I talked about trying to keep this as simple as possible. So my recommendation is just a one page document. And Joe, I think you agree with that, don't you? Yeah, I think you can get the most important uh, points in there. Right, I think so too. Okay, well, just an idea. 
Okay, so I, I, this is all great news. I think, uh, you know, I, I, I really have to stress um, and thank a lot of residents that basically came forward, volunteered their time, volunteered their effort to sort of make this thing happen. I don't think this would be happening if it weren't for the efforts of a lot of residents that came down there, volunteered their time, and then also went ahead and bought memberships, some of which probably won't even use them, but they're essentially making a donation to the pool. And for that, I think we owe a great deal of thanks to a lot of people. Yay. So, with that said, I'd like to sort of either have a sort of a straw vote, a paper vote, or maybe a show of hands. Are we all in favor, everyone on council here, are we all in favor of opening this pool? Yes. 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 All right. It's a unanimous vote. Go to the vote. Well, yeah. I was wanting to see if I could get the vote or not. <laughs> I'm unsure. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm all in. At this oh, point. You, you better lock your door, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's great. Okay. That's great. We all agree. And I think that I think the June 15th date is the, is a doable date because I believe the 15th falls on a Monday. It does. That'll give us that last weekend to sort of do any last minute uh, cleanup, touch up, uh, whatever we're doing to make sure the pool is completely open and ready to go come Monday. Give that water a chance to warm up. <laughs> All right, moving on. Uh, let's do the uh, two committee reports. And uh, I don't care which one we want to start with. You want to start with um, go to safety, do safety first. Avi, you want to read that? It's, it's first on the agenda, so. Okay. Okay, <clears throat> bear with me here. The safety committee met on May 21st, 2020 at 5 p.m. Present at the meeting were committee chairman Avia Graves, committee members Maggie Palazzolo and Kelly Rankin, councilman Marcy Lewis and Don Keyes. The meeting began at 5 p.m. to discuss the safety of 5G. A resident of Marymount had expressed concern of potential safety hazards to 5G coming to Marymount. As such, it was referred to the safety committee for discussion. Upon further review with Ed and Pete, our <clears throat> village solicitor, we are unable to prevent companies from coming into Marymount to install 5G. We also have limited say as to the placement of these devices. However, the company is willing to work with us on that placement as long as said placement still results in the proper 5G coverage of the area. The committee also reviewed data regarding the safety of 5G and um, there is no definitive scientific data to say that 5G is not safe. However, with that being said, it would still be our preference to try and work with this company on placement of these devices to locations that would be distanced from residential homes as much as possible for aesthetics as well as for any potential health concerns. It is the recommendation of the committee and on keys um, is also in support to move this matter to public works so that work can start to engage with this company to try and influence the placement of these devices to best be served by Marymount residents. Respectfully submitted and signed by Avi Graves, Maggie Palazzolo, and Kelly Rankin. And uh, Joni has the signed version. She has the sign. Okay. Okay, you've heard the report. Do I have a motion and a second to accept the report? So moved. Second. Did you get that? Maggie. No. Okay. Yep. Maggie and Kelly. Any further discussion regarding this? I know that we're, we still have several residents that are out there that are very concerned about the health effects you know, of 5G. I do believe that we're going to have to continue to address this. This is not a settled matter, I don't believe. Right. Um, and in fact, I was anticipating, I was anticipating some emails that I was going to address during, during the address of council, but I, I'm, I'm not getting them yet, but I know that we've not heard the last of this. Right. Well, I mean, that's why it's my recommendation, as well as Maggie's and Kelly's and Donna's in agreement that we move it to public works, because okay. I think there's a lot of obviously ongoing discussion, um, even in with regards to, um, you know, what we're going to talk about later in the agenda with Foss Brown Todd and, and that um, legislation, um, yes. which will, I think completely part of this. So I think it um, it is for sure, you know, not going away. You know, I think there's a lot of work to be done on it. Um, but I do think, you know, from a safety perspective, um, you know, I just think it's better served in a public works committee for us to be able to really work, um, you know, then with the placement of where these towers go. Yeah. And on that note, you know, as it develops and we have to make this a priority, it's going to touch on other committees. I mean, but putting in public works, it's a good place to start as far as, as, far as working with uh, PeakNet and whoever else to determine the um, places of location and 
I've got an honorary member of the Public Works Committee over there. <laughs> Right. <laughs> who's been drawing maps and whatnot, so. Yeah, I just think with the public works being, you know, as a smaller group for us to be able to really, you know, dive into this and work with that um, organization, you know, work with what, you know, Ross Brown Todd potentially prepares in this legislation that we'll be able to really kind of dig into it a bit more to come back to the council as a whole to make recommendations. Yeah, as I said, there is a lot of, there's a lot of future work to be done on this. It's gonna so, break down okay. issues. We have the safety concerns, obviously, and then we have the aesthetic concerns of where they want to come into the village and place the polls. And I'll have a little bit more on that as we go into the meeting. Okay, um, on roll call then to accept the, the report, Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Ms. Rankin. Aye. Ms. Stelzer. Aye. All right, that report is uh, passed and accepted. All right. Rules and law, Maggie. Okay. So um, meeting began at 3.07 on May 29th. The Rules and Law Committee met to discuss the uh, change, the frequency and time of the council meeting. Present at the meeting was committee chair Maggie Palazzolo, Rob Bartlett, and Mark C. Lewis. The committee discussed changing the time of the regular council meetings from 7 o'clock p.m. to 7, or sorry, to 6.30 p.m. The committee recommends that the meeting be changed to 6.30 p.m. going forward. Um, we can discuss whether that's going forward through the rest of quarantine or whether that's forever, but we said it was fine forever if we want to. Um, the committee recommends that the meeting be changed to 6.30 p.m. going forward. And rule, uh, in addition, rule one of the rules of council states that there will be one meeting in the months of June, July, and August. The committee recommends that be changed and we maintain two regular meetings per month schedule. We can always change it to one if we decide to, but it should remain consistent throughout the year. So as background in the past, it's been in the code book as having one meeting per year and it specifies the Monday. Um, and then just the last several years, we've gone ahead and had two. So we figured, why don't we just change the code book to be consistent throughout the year? And if we find a need to change it to have one meeting, June, July and or August, we can do that as we go instead of having to change it every year to make two, especially when there's just been a lot going on these last few years and we do a lot better. We don't have to vote on as many emergencies, et cetera, if we just meet and get it done. Would it by chance just be better to change it to say at least one? So that way you don't have to go back and change, you know, the, the code if we decide to you know, just, just do one meeting versus two at some point? We could, the rule is, hang on, let me grab it. The way the rule is worded, it says regular meetings of the council shall be held in council chambers on the evenings of the second and fourth Mondays of each month can, commencing at seven, which we're changing to 630. And then it says, however, during month, the months of June, July, and August, the meetings will be held once per month. June, the meeting will be held the second Monday, July, the third Monday, and August, the fourth Monday. So, I mean, we can just get rid of everything after however, and just leave it at you know, second and fourth Mondays of each month since it's already specified. And then it's really simple. And if we need to change it, which we hardly ever do, we can make amends as needed. I don't know. I mean, I'm open, but. Okay, there's, um, Joni just informed me that there's a chance that that's already been changed. It just hasn't been codified and it hasn't, you know, we haven't caught up to it yet. So we probably will go back and double check to, to okay. see that those changes are already there. But other than that, it's a good idea. Um, you, you kind of skipped to the discussion portion of this. Sorry. You've heard the report. Can I have a motion and a second to accept the report, please? So no moved. Move. All right. Okay, we've had any further discussion? We all good with this? No? Yeah. Good. good. Okay. Good. good. On roll call. Aye. Mr. Bartlett? Aye. Mrs. Graves? Aye. Dr. Lewis? Aye. Mark Palazzolo? Aye. Ms. Rankin? Aye. Ms. Delzer? Aye. All right. Now we're going to move into the uh, 5G portion of, of this meeting. And um, I just received an email here from uh, Mrs. Susan Page. She's very concerned about the 5G thing. I'm going to try to answer a couple of her questions live before we move on to the um, Frost Brown portion of this. She wanted to know exactly which company was going to be coming in um, to, to install the um, poles, huh. and that would be pace, um, pacenet.com. Uh, 
Com, I think it's called. Okay, so called? Peak. 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 Yes. And at this point in time, we don't really know whether they're coming in acting independently or whether they are the agent of, you know, Cincinnati Bell, AT&T, Verizon, they could be the agent. This is yet to be determined. Um, and there is an important distinction between the two. Um, how much money will the village receive from the placement of these towers? It's true that the village will be able to um, obtain a certain degree of revenue um, because of the placement of this. I think that would be part of the negotiating process. I think some of that is set by legislature. Oh, we have to create that. Well, we have to cre create that, but I think there are some limitations. However, there is revenue available. Um, do we have coverage model of uh, the, the delegate uh, when available should public information? Um, we don't know, we don't, she wants to know the particular kind of model, I assume, like what the poll would look like. That we don't know yet. Um, and of course, will the building commissioner and otherwise have input on the placement of the towers? Well, that is what we're going to be discussing here in a moment. Yes, we're going to endeavor, obviously, to have some say as to you know where the polls can go, what the polls will look like, so on and so forth. And that's, uh, I think we can move on because Rob and I had a phone conference with Frost Brown Todd regarding this, and there's sort of a two-pronged strategy that we need to pursue here. And, and obviously, I can't overstress that time is of the essence on this. The two prongs essentially break down like this. There's a way to have some say in management over your public right-of-way, your access right-of-way, which most utilities have a, you know, a gold-plated easement to come in and pretty much do what they want to do but apparently there is some legislation that has been drafted by other municipalities that gives some say so over the management of the right of way. That would be one strategy. The other strategy would be specific legislation regarding 5G and regarding you know, what the towers will look like, where they can go and you know, all the particulars of that. Um, and like I said, we've been working with, in fact, Frost Brown at this moment is working on a proposal which they essentially have sort of put together a a beginning proposal, they're estimating it might take about five hours worth of legal work to put something together regarding the public right of way access. And, and, and what we would have to do is basically, there's a certain degree of probably a boilerplate that's associated with the, the specifics of the 5G towers. And we need, of course, they've given us several examples of some other municipalities around Ohio, what they did, and they're actually quite good. But what we would want to do, and what, of course, every community would do, is we want to tailor this to our own specifics. And in order to do that, I'm sort of considering, you know, getting some representatives from MPF and maybe a few other, you know, residents that, you know, that have obviously an interest in this to try and tailor, you know, what this installation is going to look like, the number of towers, where they're going to be placed. Um, there's, a, there's a sort of a utility box that has to go with the base of the pole, you know, we don't want, I don't, I really don't want that just, you know, stuck out there if it can be put underground. These are a lot of little details to be worked out. But what I'm here to do tonight is basically to suggest that we agree that we're going to move with Frost Brown on this and let them proceed with drafting this legislation so that we can, you know, get something on the books because the time is of the essence element of this is very important. If we don't have this legislation on our books, prior to PaceNet making a formal application to us, you know, coming in for the building permit or some written application requesting permission to do this, there's something called a shot clock that gets started. And it's, it's sort of a countdown during, the, you know, during that time, of course, you can meet with them and object, but you're sort of, you know, it's sort of at, at it's a negotiating thing. And we don't work we are not negotiating from a power of strength on this at the current time. So that's my suggestion. Rob, do you have anything to add to this? Because you were on the call. Yeah, so um, again, yeah, there, there's two components, like Bill was saying, there's, there's the ordinance itself and then there's the design guidelines. And the design guidelines are not actually an ordinance itself. It's a separate piece of, mm -hmm. it's a do separate document. So, but you gotta get the ordinance first. So that's that's the one that's, this, is Bill is saying, is really the one we gotta get done. And I think, my understanding is we're targeting to try and have something by Monday. Yes. For Monday's council meeting. 
Well, uh, to this review, I, I, I would love to, to say that we would have it by Monday's council meeting. I, that I, I'm, I'm not certain of. I, I will, of course, be corresponding back and forth with Jack. If that's not possible, I'm here tonight to suggest that we're going to have to hold another special meeting in the middle of the week next week to pass this. Because as I'm saying, time is truly of the essence here. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I agree. Yep. yep. And one other thing, the other thing I wanna try and make sure we get included into the ordinance part is reading through these other, um, these other municipalities is the chance to be able to charge ongoing ongoing annual mm -hmm. right-of-way fees yes yep. so i think that's something we ought to be definitely looking at as well i mean dublin has in here that if if the if it's less than a mile long the area that you're giving to them you can collect ten thousand dollars a year so <coughs> seems like that's something that we could definitely we want to incorporate we, we definitely so. want to incorporate that i have a feeling that obviously that's going to be a negotiation but obviously I, I, I want us to be able to negotiate from a position of maximum strength. That's, that's the objective here. I don't want these people to come in here and just bulldoze us and basically just tell us, you know, this is the way it's gonna be because they've got these easements and they, they've got gigantic legal departments and you know, it's gonna be hard for us to fight. And hey, they'll, find, they'll find a loophole if they can. They can. Yeah. Phil, uh, I've got a fair amount of experience in uh, pipe, wire, uh cell tower billboard occupations uh yes. during my day job i spent a lot of time on this type of stuff mm -hmm. and so um we can find some comps out there that will get lead us during this process so i think we'll have good data uh to be able to throw back at anybody who wants to put an occupation in, in our village on our right away and and this is commonly done I mean, the agreements I deal with every day go back to the old railroad days when they were putting wires along railroad tracks. And it was a huge profit center for the railroads in those days. So, Yeah, there's that, like I said, as Rob just mentioned a minute ago, they, they did provide us with the two pieces of the legislation, one from Canal Winchester and one from Dublin, you know, right here in Ohio. And they're, I think they're well-crafted. They cover a lot of, you know, bases. I think though it does basically it's going to come down to does it stand would it withstand legal muster and of course this is something that we we can consult with ed on this as well um but yes but going forward this is i think this is the only direction that we have to go in mm -hmm. so, yeah no i agree yeah. i agree we need yeah. to and we need to move quickly I agree. yeah so i would like to have you all either by raise of hand nod of head or something that that we go ahead and pursue this yep um, we'll wait. Um, wait, what are we, what are we thumbs up in here? That we, that we basically pursue immediately this let that we, that we let Frost Brown essentially draft this initial legislation to, that gets us started on the process. Jack estimates it's going to take approximately five hours of legal work to do this. We're not talking about a great deal of money here, but you know, it's like I said, this is the beginning. This is the start. Yeah. Okay. You need a formal vote. Well, I, I well, okay, we can take a vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. yeah. Mr. Bartlett. Aye. Mrs. Graves. Aye. Dr. Lewis. Aye. Ms. Palazzolo. Aye. Ms. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Stelzer. Aye. Okay, then we're all agreed. So I'll I'll talk with Jack tomorrow to pursue this. All right. Um, uh, the next uh, piece to, to, we're here to discuss tonight, oh, shoot, I'm, I'm going to go and get it here, but I forgot to bring it over here, um, is, the, is the paper street. We got a bid in. I've got the bid. Yeah, do I, it's on my desk. It's right on my <coughs> up against the bamboo. <laughs> well, let me, your back is killing you. Let me, I'll get it. Well, anyway, like I said, we've got the bid and I have just an open, one. Just, yeah, just the one. Oh I my an, gosh, are you serious? But well, hey, look, it's a good. Um, but there, let me just say this, and I'm going to bring this back over to Joe. Um, there have been some developments on this. Apparently, there's been activity on the property. I think there may be a bidder out there. The bidder may be interested in not only acquiring the house, but the additional property. And I, I'm assuming, Joe, you need to get in on this. There will be further discussions. Um, apparently, there is a way, even if Mr. Turner wishes to proceed with, the, with buying the paper streets, 
that once we fill out the purchase and sale contract agreement, that particular contract may be able to be assigned to the new buyer and thereby, you know, we would go ahead and conclude the transaction. All right, as you all can see, I have the bid here. It's still, it's still sealed. I haven't opened it yet. Open it, open it, open it, open it. I'm opening it now. And the winner is? <laughs> Door number one. Door number one. Well, it's, it's very formally written, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mr. Turner, Mr. Charles Turner is submitting a bid for $50,001. <laughs> what are you going to do with a dollar? I'm going to buy us all ice cream. Can we go to Disney World? <laughs> all right. So, so we have a formal bid. Um, Joe, you want to go ahead and jump in here? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, there is active bidding on the house. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, there, there will be a couple different gyrations over the next couple of weeks to see what exactly is going on there. Um, and, and, you know, just hang on and we'll see, you know, how it plays out here. I mean, uh, but, but, you know, I would assume that, you know, we're still proceeding as we anticipated originally that the lot would be subdivided and a house built on it, but anything can happen as you get into this stage of the process. But, you know, at least we have now put the, uh, uh, Paper Street that we acquire off the vacation out for bid. So we've you know, complied with Ohio revised code. And now we'll just see what the next, and, and the next step will be to, to get to a purchase and sale agreement with the successful yeah. bidder. Right. Uh, and, and that'll take some time just to you know, get the lawyers to you know, craft the documents on both sides. You know, not only our lawyers, but uh, Mr. Turner's lawyers. So uh, hopefully we can get that done in the next seven to, to 14 days. But you know, there, there might be a couple of wrinkles that come up here, but this is this is normal in any type of transaction like this. So, so let, I, me let me clarify. So he's made a bid. We accept the bid. Yes. And we draw up a sale agreement. And that would be who would draw that up? Would that be Ed that would draw that up or? Well, Joe and I had a conference today, another conference with Frost Brown, who apparently have some experience at this. And I think what we're sort of proposing here is sort of a shared responsibility. Frost Brown, they will bring to bear their expertise in the areas of this, I, I would assume. I mean, I'm not exactly sure of the details how it's going to work out. They will do part of it. Ed will review it. Ed will, will also do part of it. And I, I think it's going to be a little bit of a fluid situation going forward, you know, as we begin to nail down the particulars. I can't say with you know, the utmost certainty how it would play out, but I would assume it would be in that fashion. Okay. Ed, Ed are you good with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay, okay. Joe, do you have anything yeah, else? I, I'm gonna try to set the deadline that we get the, get the first draft of the PSA done in seven to 10 days. I think that's a reasonable time frame. I have no idea who the lawyer is for, you know, Mr. Turner, we have to figure that out. And I would think that we would take the first crack at the PSA. Um, you know, being the, being the seller of the property. So we can make sure that the provisions that we specified in the bid process are uh, ad adequately uh, 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 stated in the PSA. And let's not forget that they need, the buyer will be doing the survey, which will allow us to have a legal description, which is an integral part of the PSA. So that has to happen too. And, you know, with uh, home sales picking up, sometimes it's hard to find surveyors. So, uh, you know, there's a couple of steps we have to go through here, but I think seven to 10 days is probably reasonable to get that first draft of the PSA, uh, purchase and sale agreement together. I'm sorry. I, you know, uh, Rob reminded me yesterday, sometimes they use terms that, you know, most people that aren't, that, that don't do this, don't understand what I'm talking about, but a purchase and sale agreement, but we can, we can get the first drafts of the P purchase and sale agreement done without having that survey, but it is a step that has to be completed before we can execute. So, um, just a couple of things that have to happen here, but uh, it'll, it'll probably be sooner rather than later to, to move forward. Yeah, and and to sort of follow up on that, because um, Frost Brown went ahead and sort of sent out a, a little bit of an outline of the steps that would be involved. Once we have the PSA, we will have to draft an ordinance, basically, I guess, you know, to authorize the, the PSA. And then we'll need another ordinance that would be to, you know, to actually vacate the paper street um, 
what am I living out here? General oversight and protection, making yes. sure the buyer, yeah, there'll be some oversight to make sure that the buyer basically, I guess, you know, takes care of his in, end of it. So we, we will be, we will be drafting or they will be drafting or Ed will be drafting, uh, you, you know, again, legislation to legally let this go forward. So any other questions? So yeah, there's PS, PSA and two ordinances. And two, two ordinances, yes, yeah. yes. And then there's also the closing documents. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Right. Documents. yeah, the closing documents, you get, they have to be recorded and so on and so forth. But again, you know, it's a step-by-step -step process, I think, as we go forward. Maggie, you got a question? You look like you want to ask something. I'm good. No? Okay. Everybody else good? Mm -hmm. Okay, we've covered everything. So we're giving the okay for, we've done it. Do we give the okay for that? I mean, well, like, okay, just let me double check. I mean, we are all in agreement that Frost Brown will be doing at least a certain aspect, you know, of this, of the sale transaction. Yeah, there's yeah. sort of agree a bit. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I'm there. Okay. All right. All right. We're adjourned. Bye. Thank you. Bye. You all. Bye. I will eat alone. Farewell. As we just say that goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>